Hi everyone, welcome back on stage one. We have here a few talks related to security and then uh, API management. So the first one is uh, Anders and I welcome Anders on the stage. Are you there? And Anders has promised to have maybe some demos if everything goes fine. And here is Anders. Hi, Anders. Thanks. How are you and doing? Hi. Do you have snow in Stockholm right now? No, no, it's not snow. It's kind of gray, but uh, no snow as far as I can see. So you are like that much, like an inch to the south <laughs> compared to <laughs> us in Helsinki. Yeah, yeah we have some, it's like some snow going on. Uh, okay, so policy as code is an interesting subject. I first came across that actually in, in a conference in Stockholm some years ago, and I'm eager to see what Anders has to say about that. So Anders from Stura is going to show us policy as code. And if you are ready to share your screen, then off you go, Anders. Yeah, I think I'm already sharing my screen. It's does it work? Uh, does it work to share my screen? Or all right, I'll, I'm yes, gonna... it does. But okay. <laughs> the manager was pulling me backstage, so I couldn't answer you. Yes, everything okay. is working fine. So off you go. Okay, great. I'll just get started. And so today we're going to talk about policy as code, or to be more uh, detailed, policy based access control, and and obviously this goes for APIs, which is the theme of this conference, but uh, it's not uh, strictly limited to, to that. An introduction to open policy agents. Uh, first, an introduction to me. I'm Anders. I work as a developer advocate at Styra, which is the company uh, invented, who invented open policy agent, which, is, which I'll, I'll be talking about today. Uh, my background is in software development and uh, primarily in identity systems. I've been working on OPA for about two years by now. And when I don't, I'm uh, mainly uh, interested in cooking, food, and football. And uh, you'll find me on GitHub, or you'll find me on Twitter, uh, well, my first name uh, followed by my last name. So the challenge here, why OPA, why policy as code? The challenge or the problem we're trying to solve here is basically to manage policy in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. So uh, in any kind of modern uh, application stack, we have all these uh, programming languages and frameworks. We have deployment targets like Kubernetes, Docker, uh, and infrastructure uh, projects like Terraform. And then we have, of course, all these cloud environments. And then we have all these databases. And um, maybe slightly exaggerated, but this, this could really be uh, a single company that we're looking at here. This is far from all uh, available options. So uh, what we have is uh, certainly complex. Uh, and our systems are certainly heterogeneous. So our goal here, uh, why why OPA? There's cert there's currently no uh, good way of unifying policy enforcement across this whole stack, or there wasn't until OPA came along. So this is the goal of OPA. It's kind of unifying policy uh, enforcement across this diverse set of products and technologies. So what is OPA then? Uh, OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. It offers a unified tool set and a framework for policy across the stack. It decouples policy from application logic, meaning you can uh, take uh, policy logic, like who gets to do what, and you remove that from the business logic of your application. So you can reason about it separately, and you can test it separately, and you can deploy it separately. That's kind of what uh, the, the whole point about decoupling. 
Uh, OPA makes a difference between uh, policy decisions and policy enforcement. And OPA doesn't really do uh, enforcement. That's still up to your application to, to uh, decide what to do with uh, this decision that OPA provided. So OPA is kind of like an oracle. You ask it a question and you get back a, a response. And then it's up to you to act on that. So an example of a question like that in your API might be that this user uh, coming in with this access token, uh, what is that user allowed to do? Or is that user allowed to download this file? And then you'd send that query to OPA and you get back a response. Uh, and that's how OPA works. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, similar to how you'd ask a database for data, uh, you'd ask OPA for policy decisions. And these policies, they're written in a declarative language called Rego, and we'll uh, look into that in a bit. And again, since OPA is a general purpose policy engine, uh, it has use cases ranging from uh, a lot of use cases, uh, ranging from Kubernetes, mission control, you have microservice authorization, API authorization, you can uh, use OPA for infrastructure as code, uh, data source filtering, uh, CI CD policies, uh, and whatnot. So, anywhere uh, where you can think, like, here, here's probably uh, a good fit for some type of policy, that's, uh, that's where OPA fits in. So, OPA is an open source project with a quite a vibrant community. I think we have. Uh, this these numbers here is are a, a month old or so, so so it's uh, even higher now. But but a very active and vibrant open source community. But of course, it, it's not just an open source community. But but OPA also has seen uh, quite some adoptions uh, from these major uh, or big companies uh, all across the globe. And as uh, Kelsey Hightower said, the Open Policy Agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework to help me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that's kind of what OPA is all about, summar summarized in uh, a single tweet. OK, so let's take a deep dive into OPA and then uh, Rego, the policy language of OPA. So the decision model uh, works kind of like this. We were we were uh, we touched on it briefly before when we talked about OPA as an oracle. So it works like this: your service or your API has OPA running uh, just alongside it. So you normally want to deploy OPA as close to your service as possible. So it's not like you have one OPA where every service goes and ask these questions, but rather you can kind of push OPA as close to the service as possible. And that, and the point of that is to allow uh, both for uh, as low latency as possible. So any of these queries should be really, really fast. But it also allows you to keep uh, certain data or allows you to have a certain data as local as possible as well. Because uh, authorization decisions for one service uh, might not necessarily apply to another service, but uh, these uh, these type of decisions are often pretty local. So the way it works is the service sends a query to OPA, and this query is kind of a, uh, any JSON value, and, and we'll uh, look into that in a bit. And OPA will simply just respond with any uh, JSON value as well. So you might say, uh, uh, is this user allowed to access uh, data at this endpoint? And OPA could uh, either respond with yes or true or false, or it could uh, respond with any other type of JSON value, like a, uh, uh, an object or maybe a string that would say uh, no, because you are not in the group uh, which we expect here. So that, that's the policy decision model. And again, this service could be uh, your uh, API gateway. It could be your service mesh container. It could be your data source or any other uh, type of app or service which can talk JSON. And again, uh, OPA runs as a lightweight self-contained server binary. And ideally, you deploy OPA as close to the service as possible. 
Uh, in a Kubernetes context, this often would mean like uh, you, ru you run it as a sidecar container, meaning in, inside the same pod. And the way your app or service communicates with OPA is through it, OPA's REST API. That's how you send in the JSON and you get the JSON back. But there's also other integrations possible for uh, as a Go library. You can also use it for Envoy or Istio-based apps. And there's also some web assembly features. Rego then is a declarative high language policy language, uh, which is used by OPA. And the way a policy works, it's it defines an any number of rules. Uh, and again, these rules could be true or false, but uh, they can actually return any type uh, available in JSON. We have over 100. 40, it says here, but I think it's over 150 built-ins uh, to date. So if, you're, if your policy wants to uh, deal with JSON web tokens, uh, date, time, uh, IP ranges, or whatever, there are helper methods to help, uh, to help with that. There's a unit testing framework available, uh, and it's a great, or it's a very well-documented uh, policy language. And as you'll see here in just a few minutes, uh, we also have a playground available where we can actually try policies or policy offering without uh, even downloading OPA. So uh, when you write policies, it's not just policy. We often need to interact with the outside world uh, to, for example, obtain data. And some forms of data that OPA understands or some ways you can provide OPA with data. It's either through uh, JSON web tokens. This is very common if you integrate with, for example, OAuth or OpenID Connect. Uh, you can also provide data as part of the query. So if that's pretty normal when, when you have a request targeting a certain endpoint, then you just ask uh, OPA, uh, can the, is this request allowed? given this is the endpoint they, they're trying to target. And there's also, if you, if you need to push more data than that, maybe you need to push your uh, a, a user store or a permission database or something, you can either take that data and kind of push it into each of your OPA instances. There's also uh, APIs for having OPA go and fetch that data uh, on demand or, uh, or periodically. OK, so uh, time for a little demo. I hope you all can still see my uh, screen. And I, I prepared a sum here uh, to the top of the right here. So that's kind of an example query where we ask OPA. Uh, the method here in this request coming in is it's a GET request. So somebody is trying to read from an endpoint. And we have a path here, which is really an array of, of path components. So somebody is trying to read the user's endpoint. And we have the actual user of the request here. So the way uh, OPA works is one policy here is in a package. And then again, it's a series of rules. So uh, we could, for example, create a rule here, which would call allow. And if uh, let's say that all users can read from the user's endpoint, and we could do something like this. So we'd say if the input method is equal to get, uh, and the path, the input is equal to users, then uh, allow should be true. So the way uh, Rego works is that if all the assertions inside of this rule body is true, then the rule is going to be true. So if we evaluate this here, we can see that in this case, uh, yes, allow is going to be true because both of these conditions are true. So if we change this to something like put or post, and we evaluate that again, we can see that uh, we got an empty response back. And that's uh, by default, if, if this does not evaluate, the value of this rule is just gonna be undefined or empty. So what we might wanna do here, we might wanna say by that by default, 
allow should be false. So if if we don't get any response from OPA, we're just going to say, OK, we're not allowed. So now we have a very basic uh, policy in place, and we can start to build on top of that for more authorization decisions. So uh, what if we, we would want to allow the put method, but only if the user path uh, corresponds to that of, of the user who requests the change. So what we want to do here is we want to say that Anders can modify uh, user data, but only for his own user. He can't uh, modify data on other users. So we're going to add a new allow rule here. The way it works here is that if any of these rules are true, then allow is going to be true. And inside of these rules, it's add. So if both of these conditions are true, then allow is, and this allow is going to be true. OK, so we're going to do uh, input method again. And in this, this time, we want to allow put. And the next condition that must be true is that the path is equal to uh, users. And we're going to assume here that uh, the next path component here uh, is going to be that of the, na the name of the users. So you can modify, you can send a put request, but only if the next part here is uh, user name. So in, in this case, see, uh, let's see here. Input method is, and we're yeah right. So what we need to do here, we can see that now we are not allowed because we did not include a name here. And if we do, we can see that now uh, we are allowed this request because the name here corresponds to the name of the user. So if we change this to I don't know Jane. Let's see that no, uh, we're no longer allowed because uh, now we're trying to modify somebody else, somebody else's user. So that's policy offering in 13 lines of Rego and um, three or four minutes. Let's get back here. Okay, so that was super simple on policy offering. Uh, one of the main features that OPA offers for these complex distributed uh, environments is, is, is actually managing these policies because normally you'd have maybe hundreds of these services running uh, distributed. So OPA offers uh, a whole bunch of these uh, management APIs. The bundle API for distributing policies to all your OPAs the decision log API, so that all your OPAs, whatever decision they make, is reported back to a centralized uh, <clears throat> management plane, where you, so you can know and monitor uh, the status of your cluster. There's also a status API for reporting back, like just um, more basic information on health and status, and a discovery API, so you can uh, provision configuration to, to your OPA instances running in your cluster from one centralized endpoint. So, <clears throat> so while OPA itself is distributed, it has all the facilities needed to also uh, manage this uh, from a central location. So, uh, so that was very quickly on OPA and, and uh, on Rego. And if you're curious about this uh, and like where to go next, I'd, sug I'd suggest you start small. Maybe do what we just did here. Check out the OPA Playground uh, and, uh, and start experimenting with policies and, and maybe a few unit tests. And the OPA documentation is a terrific resource. So make sure to check it out. Maybe keep that one in one tab and have the playground in another and just try things out. And, and after that, consider APIs, microservices, or applications that are near you and, and see uh, where could, could you benefit from uh, decoupling policy from uh, application or business logic. And then simply start to delegate some responsibilities to OPA. And maybe you can start with a single endpoint uh, just to begin somewhere. 
and deploy that and then build experience from that. After that, you can uh, consider scaling up. Have a look at these uh, management APIs. Uh, you, you Eventually, you want to log what, whatever OPA decides. You want to know so you can follow up on that and see if there are any violations in your cluster. And for learning Rego, uh, there's a fantastic resource called the Styra Academy, which I can heartily recommend. And uh, we also have a very vibrant open source uh, community active on Slack. So uh, with that, I say thank you. And uh, I wonder if there is any questions. Yes, you can stop wondering because there are some questions. Uh, the, I'm trying to kind of make sense if it's a one or two part question here first. Uh, so there are a couple. So Benishu is asking, um, I don't know if it's relevant to this context. Is there a way to manage the possible operation displayed on an HOS? Uh, I'm sorry, I never know how to... Uh, pronounce that probably response to match the rights in an automated way and does OPA facilitate that and then there's display to the OAuth um, authentication user only the operations his rights and scopes are allowed, allowed to him did you make any sense out of that <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was a super long question and yeah. and uh, I'm not sure I, I fully uh, understood but but yeah, integrating OAuth, if, if, and I could hear some, uh, some parts on OAuth and some parts on scopes there. Yeah. And yeah, you can, and, and yeah, so, so what scopes are for OAuth is a, it's a pretty coarse grained uh, authorization mechanism, mm. which means that uh, for any token issued by the token issuer, they can designate that token to only, uh, to earn only a, a certain subset of services, which is like, that's really what the, the scope is about. So OPA itself can definitely work with scopes, uh, but it just adds uh, a whole level of granularity on top of that. Yeah, I, I think that we we kind of all go with the open ID <laughs> connect approach and, and kind of know that who is the end user and, and then can get the user IDs to this policy. I think it's a much more effective way. But actually, Benishu is, is pointing out that he's, he's mainly interested in the kind of hypermedia approach um, and, and how that might work. And maybe that's relevant or not. So, Yeah, I, and I think like, uh, OPA does not replace any of these other technologies. It's oh. it's more adds uh, a, a level of granularity on top of OAuth and OpenID Connect. Yeah, I I would actually be interested to know. Like, I mean, in its essence, OPA is a rules engine, and and there have been like business rules engines, all kinds of rules rules engines. Uh, for a long time, and they all have good sides and bad sides. But how how do you see this kind of working? If you already have some kind of a rules engine there, and and should you still use OPA, or is OPA the answer when you only need the rule, rule engine for the the security side? Yeah, that's a good question, and and I've honestly I've not worked with that many rule engines, and if you have one and and it, you're happy, like why would you change? <laughs> but yeah. but what I what I think is like what differs OPA from from many of these uh, at least other policy engines uh, that are from like almost two decades old mm. is is like that OPA is made for this kind of cloud native environment uh, and distributed where you yeah. have where you don't have like this one service but you have hundreds or thousands of services so i'd say that is uh, like when I, when i have compared opa to other like like sacml or other policy engines uh, from the last one or two decade back that's uh, that's uh, normally a main differentiator yeah, I would say so too because the the ones that uh, used to be be there and are actually still somewhere alive are, are mainly like you know you have Java based rules engine that works with Java and you have some some others so so I think that the kind of uh, language agnostic and distributed approach is really 
really good in this, even though it only um, handles the security side. But on the other hand, there are lots of issues sometimes with the business rules in, in the other parts. So security is usually the one that where, where it makes sense at least to have that. Good. Thank you, Anders. And there is some question about provisioning the policies and UI there in the chat. So maybe somebody from your team or you can answer it in the chat. Yeah, That's sure. Specific. And I thank you, Anders, and I welcome.